Hi, uh, my name is Erica Laszlo and I am the outreach manager for the Franco Cardiovascular Center here at Michigan Medicine. I'm also gonna be your moderator for this evening. Uh, thank you for attending this webinar this evening regarding patient selection and timing of advanced heart failure therapies. Your speakers for this evening will be Dr. Abbas Batar and Dr. Francis Pagani. Regarding any questions you may have this evening, we ask that you um, have a question for the presenter that you use the Q&A icon, which you will find in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question for me, such as a technical issue, please use the chat icon, which you will also find in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We will also be offering closed captioning this evening, and we would like to give a special thank you to Kate Miller from Screenline Captioning. We would like to take attendance this evening, and if you could please use the chat box, again, in the lower part of your toolbar, to please send your first and last name, that would be greatly appreciated. We do not have any financial disclosures um, at this time. If you're interested in claiming a CME credit, please feel free to go ahead and scan the QR code, which you will find on the right-hand side of the screen. There is also, um, you have the ability too, to log into your My CME account as well. And just know that we will also include the QR code at the end of the presentation this evening. And additional information will be sent tomorrow morning on how to claim your um, credit for this presentation. So we wanna go ahead and get started. And our first presenter for the evening will be Dr. Batar. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Abbas Batar. I'm one of the heart failure faculty at the University of Michigan. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and today we'll be talking about patient selection and timing uh, of advanced heart failure therapies. So um, as many of you know, heart failure is uh, very common and more than 6 million adults in the United States have heart failure. And this number will most likely increase over the coming uh, few years with an annual incidence of more than 800,000 cases each year. Um, it is estimated that more than 8 million adults will have heart failure by year 2030. And about half of the patient who gets diagnosed with heart failure will die within five years of diagnosis. And almost a quarter to a half of patients who are labeled as having advanced heart failure will die within one year of diagnosis. Now, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Associations came up with different stages for heart failure from A to D. And when we see patients with heart failure, we classify them into one out of four functional uh, capacity classification, and those are the New York Heart Association. For the purpose of today's presentation, we'll be focusing mainly about, on stage D, which is refractory heart failure requiring specialized interventions, and patient with NYHA class three and four, and those would be the patient with marked limitations. Now, the Interagency Registry for Mechanically Assisted Circulatory Support, the Intermax, better stratified those patients, the patient with NOHA class three and four, into seven groups or seven profiles, and those are called Intermax profile. And they, bring, they have numerical values from one to seven. So a patient with heart failure with an Intermax one profile will be someone with critical cardiogenic shock and intervention should take place within a few hours or the patient will die. A profile two would be someone with progressive decline and an intervention should take place within a few days. And here when I'm talking about an intervention, we're talking mainly about uh, durable mechanical surgical support. And it goes on and on uh, all the way down to profile seven, and those would be the patient with NLHA class three, and those patients usually for the most part would not benefit from advanced heart failure evaluation. Now, what is the definition for advanced heart failure? Different societies came up with different definitions for advanced heart failure. 
I think the simplest one is the definition that the Heart Failure Association of the European Society of Cardiology came up with. And for the most part, when the way they defined um, heart failure, it's a subject with significant functional limitation in the setting of structural cardiovascular abnormalities and persistently elevated uh, biomarkers or signs of congestion that requires frequent hospitalizations for intravenous diuresis or has signs or symptoms of learning for low cardiac output that might require intravenous uh, anotropic support. And I will be talking some more about those in a bit. Now, how common is advanced heart failure? So it is estimated that six to 25% of patients with heart failure ha do have advanced heart failure. In this study published in 2011, they estimated that almost 300,000 patients have advanced heart failure. And this number is most likely higher now, mainly due to a couple of things. One of them is improved lifespan the, and improved cardiovascular therapeutics. So out of those 300,000 patients, you know, we haven't for performed more than 3,000 to or 3,500 heart transplant per year in the United States. And this is, you know, uh, projected in the blue bars in here. And the number of heart transplants hasn't really changed over the last 20 years or so. Now, with the advancement in durable mechanical circulatory support, now we have more durable and safer pumps. We've seen an exponential growth in the number of uh, left ventricle assist device that have been implanted over the last decade or so. And uh, usually left ventricle assist device can be implanted as a bridge to decision or as a destination therapy. And Dr. Pagani will be talking more about that later today. Now, what is the uh, prognosis? What happened to patients uh, with advanced heart failure? And this question was answered by the medical arm for mechanically assisted circulatory support. So it's a registry. It included uh, 160 patients with New York Heart Association in class three or four. And those patients had a um, intermax profile between four and seven. So none of those patients were on intravenous inotropes. None of them were listed for heart transplants. And most of them had high risk features. And what I mean with that, all of them had at least one heart failure hospitalization over the last year. And here we can see that only 47% of those were alive with medical therapy at one year of follow-up. A fifth of them died and 30% either got transplanted or received a left ventricular assist device. And here on the graph on the right side, on the right part of the slide, we can see that the overall survival and survival free of MCS or LVADs was also significantly lower with progressive sicker baseline intermac profile. So what does that mean? So the sicker the patient is, and here intermac profile four, their chance of dying or acquiring durable mechanical surgical support is pretty high compared to the less sick patient than baseline. Now, if you go back one step and talk about the clinical course for heart failure. So heart failure is a progressive disease and the overall health and quality of life decline over time. And this decline is nonlinear and it is interrupted by sudden death due to malignant ventricular arrhythmias or it may end up in progressive pump failure and death. And with initial diagnosis of heart failure, we institute different therapeutics. And here I'm talking about medical therapy. And as the disease progresses over time, we have escalation in the therapeutics that we provide. And as the disease progress, it starts to affect other systems. And this is when the patient goes into a spiral um, and many of them end up in cardiogenic shock and die. So it's very important to recognize the markers of advanced heart failure therapy and important to refer this patient early on the process so, they get, so that they can be evaluated in a timely manner for advanced heart failure therapies if they're a candidate for that. Now, with regard to the markers for advanced heart failure, a lot has been published about different markers. So for today's purpose, I will, be, I will go over some of those markers that most of you can identify uh, easily in your day-to-day -day practice. So I'm gonna start with clinical biomarker. So each patient I see in my clinic, uh, 
ask them three questions. The first question, whether they had any heart failure hospitalization. And why is that? Because we know that after each hospitalization, the odd of dying because of heart failure increased by threefold or by 300%. And the risk is the highest within the first few months after hospitalization. And this risk will drop over time, but it will never go back to pre-hospitalization level. The second question I ask is how often they've been hospitalized over the last year. And here we can see that the higher the number of heart failure hospitalization, and if you can, and that's presented in the dark, black, in the black line, gray and light gray line. So that's one hospitalization, two and three. So the higher the number of heart failure hospitalization, the worst outcome. Similarly, uh, with the third question that I ask is how long they've been hospitalized. So the more prolonged the hospitalization, the longer the hospitalization, the worst outcome. So to give you an example, so this line would represent a patient who had three heart failure hospitalization for more than three weeks. They have almost a 15 fold increase in mortality compared to someone who got hospitalized one time for less than a week. They had a four fold increase in mortality. Now, the second clinical biomarker is intolerance to medical therapy. So we all know that for a good subset of patients with systolic heart failure, many of those over time, their ejection fraction is gonna drop, their blood pressure is gonna drop, their cardiac output is gonna downtrend, and that will be associated with an upregulation in their uh, renin angiotensin system and their sympathetic system. And many of those patients will depend on upregulation of those two systems to maintain their blood pressure and kidney perfusion. And whenever we add a blocker to the system, the blood pressure is going to drop or they're going to develop a worsening kidney function. And here on the left hand of the slide, we can see this is a cohort of patients with systolic heart failure admitted with a heart failure exacerbation. And here we can see that the patient who did not tolerate an ACE inhibitor due to cardiorenal reasons, mainly low blood pressure or progressive or worsening kidney function or chronic kidney disease, they had almost a two-fold increase in mortality at one year of follow-up. And a similar pattern here, we can see on the right hand of the slide, patients who did not tolerate beta blocker or whose beta blocker were stopped because of low blood pressure or right ventricle dysfunction, they had a worse outcome at three months of follow-up. Now moving to the second, the third set of clinical biomarker, diuretic dose. And why is that important? So as I previously discussed, as heart failure progresses and the blood pressure drops, there's hypoperfusion to the kidney. And that leads to increased antidiuretic hormone uh, release, which will lead to more water reabsorption and more fluid retention. And as the disease progresses, there's more release of those hormones, more fluid retention, and those patients will start to require higher dose of diuretic. And so here, high dose diuretic is more of a marker of disease progression. And here we can see that patients required more than 160 milligrams of Lasix on outpatient setting did way worse than those who required a dose of diuretic less than 80 milligram of Lasix per day. And a similar pattern can be seen on the inpatient side. And this data summarized the cohort of patients admitted with acute heart failure exacerbation. And we can see a linear relationship between the dose of intravenous diuretics and mortality. And here we're talking about in-hospital mortality and mortality at six months of follow-up. Now, moving to the first biochemical markers, I'll be talking about kidney function. So there's a very close relationship between the heart and the kidney. And usually if one system is not doing well, the other will not do well. And this relationship is called cardiorenal, cardiorenal syndrome. There are five different types of cardiorenal syndrome. So type one is where we have an acute cardiac insult will lead to an acute kidney insult. Type two, when we have a chronic cardiac process like heart failure, whether it's just chronic systolic or diastolic heart failure, over time will lead to progression of kidney dysfunction and chronic disease. And type three is an acute kidney insult leading to acute cardiac injury. Type four, chronic kidney insult leading to a, to a chronic cardiac injury. And type five is some, it's totally unrelated to the heart or the kidney, like someone coming in with sepsis or uh, anaphylactic shock. So a totally unrelated process with the heart and kidney, which can cause damage to both of those. And why, why kidney function is important? 
So here we can see a patient coming in with acute heart failure, admission creatinine clearance would predict outcome up to six or seven years of follow-up. And the lower the creatinine clearance, the worse the outcome. And a similar pattern can be seen in patients with chronic systolic heart failure on the outpatient side. And this data was taken from the DITCH trial. So for patients with chronic kidney disease stage four or five, had the double mortality compared to those who had chronic kidney disease stage uh, one or two. And kidney function has a huge implication when patients are being assessed for advanced therapies. Because we know that, and this is data taken from the Intramax, so we know that patients who received 11 ventricle assist device, those who had chronic kidney disease stage four or five did worse than those who have chronic kidney disease stage three. And those who have chronic kidney disease stage three did worse than those who have chronic kidney disease stage one or two. Similar pattern is seen in patients who get transplanted. So we know that worse kidney function will lead to a higher risk of intra-op and post-op complication. Um, and from here stems the importance of early referral once we, you know, to advanced therapy once we start to see the kidney function declining. The uh, other biomarkers I would like to discuss today are hypovolemia and hypoalbuminemia, albuminemia. So hyponatremia is mainly due to activation of the renin angiotensin and increased ADH, uh, and that leads to more fluid absorption and retention, and subsequently to hyponatremia. And here, low sodium, defined as the sodium of less than 130, is associated with worse clinical outcome. Now, with regard to albumin, so and albumin and prealbumin are used as by markers of overall nutrition. And we know that patients with heart failure, um, they live in kind of a pro-inflammatory pro states and heart failure is a catabolic disease in a way. So many of those patients will lose their muscle mass and their adipose tissue over time. Their weight might not change, but they lose their muscles and their adipose tissue and they build up fluid. And they might, they might not see this drop in weight until they get diaries and the volume status optimized. So here we can see that baseline albumin at time of referral to a heart failure clinic, those who had a low albumin, less than 3.4, did way worse than those who had a relatively higher albumin level. Again, cardiac cachexia or malnutrition is a marker of advanced heart failure. Now, moving to uh, natriuretic peptide, which are a hormone that acts as a surrogate of congestion. And natriuretic peptide have a diagnostic value and they have a prognostic value. So we know that persistently elevated natriuretic peptide or persistent congestion is associated with worse outcome. And this is the data of patient who got admitted with heart failure. So admission of natriuretic peptide had no prognostic value. It's once they're optimized and natriuretic peptide measured on discharge. So those who had persistently elevated natriuretic peptide or persistently congested did worse than those whose natriuretic peptides were lower. And the similar pattern is seen in patients on the outpatient side. And this data is taken from the paradigm study. So we can see that the odds of survival increased by three folds in patients who had persistently low natriuretic peptide. Here, this was defined as an nt pro BNP of less than 1,000 compared to those who had a high natriuretic peptide above 1,000. And that was irrespective of whether the patient were on enalapril or uh, sacrivitra pulsartan. Now, moving to the imaging part. So, for a subset of patients with systolic heart failure, many of those, their ejection fraction is gonna drop over time. And as the ejection fraction drops, that's associated with an increased risk of sudden cardiac death or heart failure related to death due to pump failure. And the, um, as the ejection fraction drops over time, the left ventricle would remodel in a way to maintain the cardiac output. So initially this LV remodeling is compensatory, but later on, um, this mechanism is offset 
by wall stress, increased oxygen, uh, myocardial oxygen consumption, and after load mismatch. And here we can see adds the left ventricular uh, cavity enlarges the worse the outcome. Again, with the enlargement of the LV cavity, what happened is that uh, there's apical and lateral displacement of the papillary muscle. And that leads to a mitral valve uh, cordy or uh, tethering, and that leads to functional mitral regurgitation. Again, severe or uh, functional mitral regurgitation in the setting of low EF, increased LV, and diastolic dimension is a surrogatory marker of advanced heart failure. So it's not uncommon for patients who have systolic heart failure. Once their heart failure progresses, that their left ventricle and diastolic pressure will start to increase. And that will lead to um, type two pulmonary hypertension or venous pulmonary hypertension. And that per se, as the mean pulmonary artery pressure increases, that will increase the right ventricle after load. And over time, that will lead to right ventricular failure or dysfunction and will lead to more of functional tricuspid regurgitation. And both of those markers are, are well known to be marker of advanced heart failure. And here we can see there is a very good correlation between the left ventricular ejection fraction and the right ventricular ejection fraction. So as the left ventricular ejection fraction drops over time, so does the right ventricular ejection fraction. And here, when the, when, here we can see that when the patient is cohort were stratified based on the right ventricular function, those who had a poor RV ejection fraction did worse than those who had a more preserved RVEF. And why is that so important? Again, it's important when we evaluate patients for advanced therapies because persistently elevated right-sided filling pressures can lead to liver congestion and in some patients to liver cirrhosis. And liver cirrhosis will exclude patient from being evaluated for heart transplant or left ventricular assist device. Same thing, persistently elevated right-sided filling pressures can lead to worsening kidney function over time and can be, can limit what would be the option for advanced therapy for those patients. Now, moving to the functional markers, I'll be talking about two of those. The first one is six minute walk test. What it does is pretty much measure the distance covered over six minutes, and it evaluates the global and integrated response of all the system. A change of 50 meter or more is considered to be clinically significant. And here we can see that the shorter the distance the patient can do in six minutes, the worse the prognosis. So here, this is the cohort who did the who walked the shortest distance, and this is the poor patient who walked the longest distance. To better assess functional capacity, we occasionally do cardiopulmonary exercise testing. There are different parameters that we do measure or calculate. The most common one that we use when they assess patients for advanced therapy are the peak oxygen uptake, and usually the higher the value, the better, and we use a cut point of 14 milliliter per kilogram per um, minute for uh, people not on a beta blocker and for people on a beta blocker, we use a cut point of 12 and also look for percent of predicted. So what do I mean with that is that a peak VO2 of 16 for a 20 year old male is different than a peak VO2 of 16 for an 80 year old woman. So for the young man, that's considered to be a low and that's most likely going to be less than 50% of predicted. For sure. The eight-year-old lady, it's going to be acceptable. It's going to be most likely above or close to 60 or 65% predicted, and that's okay. The other variable we use is the ventilator efficiency, the VEVCO2, and it inversely correlates the cardiac output. So the higher the VEVCO2, the lower the cardiac output. And here we can see as the VEVCO2 value increases, we can see the three-year risk of mortality increases or the survival drops as the VEVCO2 increases. And when we combine both parameters together, they have an incremental prognostic value. So for patients who have low, P, low PV, um, peak VO2 and high VEVCO2, they do way worse than patients who had normal peak VO2 and VEVCO2. Now to conclude my part, so the ACC and AHA came up with the I need help mnemonic. It's, um, it's a very helpful mnemonic to uh, for uh, 
practitioner or physicians to easily identify or remember what would be the markers of advanced heart failure and when to refer the patient for advanced therapy. The one thing it lacks, it lacks like specific value. So what we did at our center, we pretty much used the same variables they've used, but we added more couple that will help physicians and to better identify those patients who needs to be referred early for advanced therapy evaluation. And here I will uh, conclude my part and um, I think Dr. Pagani will take over in a second. Okay, while we wait for uh, Dr. Pagani to get started, I just wanted to give everyone a quick reminder that if you do have a question for the presenters, so please use the Q&A icon that you will find uh, in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Also, uh, we do have closed captioning available. A little bit over to the right is the closed captioning um, icon. You can press on that as well. And then if you have not uh, sent me a chat to let me know that you are here, we just wanna take quick attendance so we know who is on the line, okay? So if you can just hit the uh, chat icon and send me your first and last name, that would be great. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Dr. Pagani. Thank you, Erica. And thank you, Dr. Patar, for a very, very great uh, summary of the conditions of when to present um, or when to uh, send patients for referral. What I really want to emphasize now is really just going over a little bit of the outcomes we expect to see with left ventricular assist device therapy. And there has been a number of important trials um, that I think are worth reviewing to give us some idea of current outcomes uh, with the therapy. Just to review uh, really what um, the components are for the left ventricular assist device. There is the initial pump, which this is an implantable uh, device, which is attached to the apex of the heart. There's a, a graft that is attached to the aorta. And essentially what this pump does is then uh, takes blood from the left ventricle, empties the blood into the aorta and really bypasses the function of the left uh, ventricle. There is current systems um, utilize a uh, way of uh, converting power uh, and um, energy here into the pump and through a percutaneous cable. Uh, that uh, cable um, uh, trans, uh, is transcutaneous, so it leaves the skin edge here and then con connects to a computer, which then connects to a, a power source, which is batteries. And these allow, uh, this, this system allows the patient to be up and mobile and free and non-tethered so they can go about a, uh, uh, their normal life with, uh, with actually reasonable, uh, reasonably good quality of life. Now, what we'll see in the immediate future, within the next three to four years, there will be totally implantable systems. So what these systems will do, they will eliminate this percutaneous lead and there will be wireless uh, energy transfer from the uh, controllers uh, to the pump. And this uh, will allow these systems to uh, patients to, to have a much more um, normal lifestyle in terms of bathing or, uh, or swimming, and so that the um, electrical systems won't have to uh, uh, be uh, restricted from uh, interaction with, uh, with the environment. Now, the other important point I, I'd like to really make is that the, the, the therapy has really seen dramatic improvements over the past 20 years. And each of, the, each of these major improvements or evolution of the therapy has occurred with major changes in the device designs. Uh, 20 years ago, we had pulsatile systems. These were very large systems that required major operations for implantations and associated with significant adverse events and with a one-year survival, even with the therapy of about 50%. Now with the uh, continuous flow pumps with axial design, we saw a major, major improvement in uh, a survival moving from 50% uh, one year survival to 75% uh, uh, survival at one year and with a significant reduction in particularly device related malfunction as the adverse event. With our new or third generation of pumps, we're actually seeing continued improvements in survival. And that's some of the data that we'll review today and major reductions in adverse events, particularly with, uh, with stroke, which I think is a very critical outcome 
And I think uh, the, the results are very promising with this technology. Just to review what the current technology looks like, these are considered continuous flow, full magnetic levitating pumps. So essentially this impeller here inside the pump is, is levitated in a magnetic field. So there's no touching parts. So essentially there's no wear on this pump and the blood flow enters the pump through the inflow cannula. It's, um, it, it, it's kinetic energy of the blood is increased through the uh, work of the pump. And then the blood flow is then exited through the outflow cannula to the aorta. Now the trial that, you know, some of the, the data that I'd like to review really is emanated from this trial. And this trial was called the Momentum 3 trial. And it looked at the HeartMate 3 pump as a uh, left ventricular assist devices for patients with advanced heart failure. And this trial was a randomized trial design comparing to the older technology, the HeartMate 2, the axial pump that I showed earlier. And this trial had three phases. It looked at patients that were on short-term support. So essentially those that were considered bridge the transplant. Uh, and then a long-term cohort uh, of patients that were thought to be destination therapy or permanent support and then a larger cohort that include up to 1,000 patients. This was a 1,000 patient uh, trial design that really was enrolled in about 18 months. It was uh, one of the fastest enrolling trials in the history of pump design, really uh, related to the enthusiasm for this uh, device and this current technology. And really the, the outcomes that were investigated were survival at two years, free of disabling stroke, or reoperation to replace or remove the malfunctioning device. And then a principal secondary endpoint was pump replacement at two years due to malfunction. And then other important endpoints which we'll review were actuary or survival, rehospitalizations, functional status, and quality of life. Now the most important um, uh, event with the primary endpoint were survival at two years free of disabling stroke. The uh, newer technology to HeartMate 3 was significantly uh, better than the HeartMate 2 technology or the axial flow uh, device. Um, and this was a, a major finding of, of the trial and an important finding. Uh, if we look at uh, how the patients that were considered short-term support or bridge to transplant compared to destination or permanent support, the results were about the same so that he, both patient groups uh, demonstrated equal benefit from the device compared to the axial flow device. When we look at the uh, power secondary endpoint, and this was a very important finding, the HeartMate 3 device was essentially free of pump replacement at, at two years. And this uh, was really an important finding. Um, the HeartMate 2 device, the axial flow device, really suffered uh, you know, from historically from limitations in the design to pump thrombosis. And so we required a fair number of patients that would experience pump thrombosis requiring replacement. And essentially the new design with the magnetically levitated system and some other features of the design really have prevented or eliminated pump thrombosis as a significant sequelae of left ventricular assist device therapy. And this I think uh, represents a major, uh, major advance with left ventricular assist device technology. Another important uh, finding was that although there was major reductions in, in, in in uh, survive um, in um, risk of pump thrombosis. Uh, there was no differences in survival, but I wanna show you some uh, further data that we've gained from the um, uh, really the um, real world experience with this device that relates to this pump that I think is, uh, would um, really enhance this, this, these data. And I think one of the major limitations of the trial was that this, this small sample size limits the ability to look at survival outcome alone. And, and, and that's the reason for a composite outpoint. And you can see here the survival for patients who are considered bridge to trans, transplant or destination or permanent support are no different. Now, if you look at the uh, competing risk analysis, so this tells you sort of what the outcomes were at two years. Uh, for all patients, uh, about 56% remained on device about 23% were able to get a transplant and about 20% died or, and then 1% withdrew from the study or 1% were explanted. If you look at the response for the bridge to transplant group, 
Uh, obviously, 43% were still on pump support at two years, with about 40% of patients being transplanted. If you look at the patients with permanent support, about 64% were still on support, and about 12% uh, received a transplant. Some patients who received a pump for destination therapy, some of the contraindications to transplant improve uh, during pump support. For instance, uh, renal function may improve. That was earlier a barrier to transplantation. Now on pump support has improved. So those patients uh, can be transplant eligible. So that does occur, but less often in the destination cohort as it does in the bridge to transplant cohort. Now, I think one of the other major uh, findings from this trial, and I think really one of the important milestones of this therapy was the reduction in stroke risk uh, that occurs with the new technology compared to the older technology. So if you look at uh, freedom from all stroke, this is all forms of stroke, even mild forms of stroke was nearly 88% at two years. That means that uh, approximately 12% of patients experience a stroke at two years or about 6% per year. If you consider uh, patients with class four heart failure in atrial fibrillation, the yearly stroke risk is about 3% uh, or so. And so that the risk of stroke with this therapy um, is, is about um, three percentage points greater than baseline risk of, of heart failure. And so this is a dramatic improvement compared to prior, um, prior risk of stroke with this technology. If you look uh, again for the bridge to transplant or destination cohorts, the benefit in reduction in stroke was seen across all groups. Now, why is this important? If you look at many of the trials that have been conducted in the field in the last uh, several years, including the endurance trial uh, or trials that compare the HeartMate 2 technology with other trials, the risk of stroke in those trials were significant. And to see that a 10% uh, uh, risk of stroke at two years, uh, essentially for the HeartMate uh, 3 device is really a, a, really a profound uh, improvement in, in, this, uh, in this adverse event. If we look at some of the other benefits of the HeartMate 3 compared to the HeartMate, 3, uh, HeartMate 2 technology, we see that the pump thrombosis or the reduction in pump thrombosis was the major benefit of the HeartMate 3 along with Reduction, significant reduction in stroke, as well as uh, bleeding events. So three important adverse events that are associated with this therapy were dramatically improved with uh, the newer technology compared to the older technology. Now, in addition to uh, the hemodynamic support provided uh, by the pump, there is uh, major improvements in um, functional status as measured by six minute walk time a six, six minute walk uh, test, and then New York Heart Association classification. So you can see at baseline, um, the six minute walk distance on average was about 136 uh, um, meters, and that increased to about 300 uh, with, with both pumps, but it demonstrates the uh, important improvement that patients see in their functional status with this therapy. And again, uh, New York Heart Association class dramatically improved uh, uh, over time with nearly all patients, about 80% of patients uh, uh, being in class one or two uh, after pump replacement. If you look at um, quality of life uh, measured by uh, the Kansas City uh, cardiomyopathy questionnaire and the uh, Euroqual 5D5L score, there's uh, major improvements in quality of life associated with LVAT therapy. So functional status and quality of life are improved uh, with this therapy. Now, I want to uh, provide some additional data um, from the Intermax uh, registry. Intermax registry, uh, for those who are not familiar with it, is a um, important registry in the United States. Uh, centers who implant LVAD devices, uh, implantable LVADs, um, are required to submit data to the Intermax registry. So. The Intermax registry represents a national registry of patients receiving LVAD therapy. And this is required by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Joint Commissions. And so we have an excellent data source of real world data to assess outcomes in patients um, 
who receive a left ventricular assist device therapy. And I think this is an important, uh, an important uh, data source for us to, to look at contemporary outcomes with uh, LVAD therapy. And so um, as again, as I just mentioned, it's a real world data source and an important uh, uh, source of information for, for, for clinicians to understand how patients respond to LVAD therapy. Now this particular 2019 Intermax annual report was, uh, was an important milestone because it was one of the first chances that we had to look at real world data of the HeartMate 3 pump. And so in this um, uh, annual report, we were able to compare the HeartMate 3 to other devices, including the HeartMate 2 device and other centrifugal devices, such as the uh, HVAD device. Now, before uh, one of the limitations, obviously, of this uh, device, uh, of this report, is that this is not a randomized um, clinical trial. These are real world data. So there are differences uh, in patient groups based on how, how, um, how the patient uh, centers treat their patients. And so some of the analysis has to uh, look at um, using risk adjusted methodology, statistical methodology to account for baseline dis uh, differences. But even with these, um, even with these um, changes or use of statistical methodology to account for these changes, there are some um, limitations in how we can interpret the data. But overall, we think that the, uh, just, uh, the findings from this study are very important. And one I'd like to, to look at is if you take, um, this is a look at device therapy at the different eras in the Intermax registry and looking at uh, the current uh, uh, data using the uh, HeartMate 3 in the most current era. And you can see that the axial flow device, which predominated or dominated the prior curves of uh, the HeartMate 2 device essentially, had a, had a two-year survival of about 70 to 72%. And if you look now, what we're achieving with the HeartMate 3 device, uh, survival of about 84%, um, that represents, I think, a significant improvement uh, in the uh, outcomes for these patients. Now, uh, this curve uh, really looks at survival uh, for patients uh, compared to other devices. So in the top purple line, we see the outcomes for the HeartMate 3 device. And in the bottom two lines, we see the outcomes for both the HeartMate 2 and the HVAD device. And you can see, again, compared to other technology that's available, the HeartMate 3 performs much better than the other devices. Now, the gold line that you see, the gold or yellow line you see there represents the current survival for heart transplantation in the United States. So that we're now seeing technology that in the first early years actually mimics survival with heart transplantation. Now, whether that will um, continue out uh, uh, is, it remains to be seen, but we're see now seeing technology that has uh, nearly equivalent survival with um, with heart transplantation within the first two years. Now we have further analyses from the 2020 Intermax annual report that's going to be reported soon. And I could say with confidence that these, re these, these findings here with this report are, are, are consistent with what we're seeing with their, our new data analyses. So I think we're really pleased to see that this new technology is offering a very, very good early survival compared to our transplantation. Now, another important uh, finding from the uh, Intermax registry is, is stroke. And the HeartMate 3 device continues to perform very well with this, uh, with this, um, with this adverse event. So if you look at the data that is most, most robust up until one year, again, about 93% of patients um, or less or free uh, at one at two years, but even less at uh, one year. So again, the, the findings that we saw in the momentum clinical trial are, are being seen in a real world experience with the HeartMate 3 in terms of uh, uh, risk of stroke. So I, I think this is uh, 
these data, both in, from the Momentum 3 trial and the um, Intermax registry are consistent with the findings that the newer technology using magnetic levitation uh, in the HeartMate 3 device and, and using centrifugal technology has really improved and reduced two major uh, adverse events, that being stroke and pump malfunction or pump thrombosis. And I think those represent important, um, important advances with the technology that could allow us in to go into and to consider trials uh, that may look at the use of these therapies for less, uh, for less advanced stages of heart failure. And I think uh, certainly for, um, for, for current indications, this represents um, important findings for our patients. Uh, our, hope, our hope is that you, you, utilizing this technology that we move forward with a totally implantable system that eliminates the driveline. So we'll actually have an ability to really uh, improve a major limitation of this trial with, with that type of device design. So I think uh, in the, currently and then in the next few years, I think the therapy represents a, a very real uh, alternative uh, to uh, medical management for sure, and uh, possibly looking at uh, uh, you know, whether this ch can challenge the early survival with heart transplantation. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Pagani. We actually do have a couple of questions. And the first one I'm gonna to give to you, Dr. Pagani, um, what are your active clinical trials right now and what do you hope to see in the future for these patients? There's uh, currently right now, um, there are uh, there, the trial, there is a trial uh, that actually Dr. Batar can speak to directly because he's the site, clinical site PI here at Michigan. But uh, we're looking at um, anticoagulation strategies uh, in these devices. So one of the major um, questions we're trying to identify is whether aspirin is necessary for as an anti-platelet uh, therapy in devices. Uh, these devices have a incidence of GI bleeding and whether aspirin is needed uh, in, is, is not known. And so we're, there's a randomized uh, national trial going on with the HeartMate 3 device looking, uh, looking at non-aspirin uh, alternatives. Then um, that's uh, it should hopefully might be a major advance uh, to try to reduce bleeding complications. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, we have a question. What type of patients are more, more likely to have heart failure repercussions from COVID? Well, that's a good question. Um, now, we know that COVID can affect the heart in pretty much in one out of two or maybe three ways. So the virus per se can affect the heart muscle per se and cause something called myocarditis. And that can lead to can have significant repercussions or can affect the back area of the heart of the pericardium and cause pericarditis. And that's usually less serious. Now we know from our own center, we've had maybe a handful of patients who had myocarditis because of COVID over the last six or seven months out of close to 900 at our center. So not very common, I would say. Um, however, also we know from registry data that patients who had a cardiac arrest were critically ill because of COVID and a cardiac arrest. When we looked into people who have heart failure versus those who did not heart failure and had a cardiac arrest, they were not, we didn't see a signal there. It was non-significant. So what I'm trying to say is like heart failure was not a risk for people to have a cardiac arrest in the hospital. There are some other markers, but heart failure was not one of them. Okay. Um, another question we have is, how do you handle patients for either VAD or transplant who self-refer or were turned down at other centers? Sure. So each patient we, we see, whether on the inpatient or the outpatient side, and you know they have advanced, you know feature of advanced heart failure, they go through process like any other patients, whether referred from other physician or not. 
whether they're turned out by their center or not. So they go through the same process. So they meet with the surgeon, the cardiologist, the social worker, the bad coordinator, and then they get presented to a committee. And then based on their evaluation, then, you know, if there's any major red flags or not, then decision is made how to proceed forward. Okay. Um, also, uh, these are some really good questions. So thank you, everyone. If you do have a question, please make sure uh, you go to the Q&A icon and um, just type away. But these are really great. We appreciate those that are sending in questions. Uh, another one that we have is, how can we best partner with you to get our patients in at the right time in their disease process? So I think we can do that and you know, that can be done in one different way. I mean, we're happy to reach out to other center to discuss like, you know, in depth, uh, more in depth, like when to refer the patient, how, you know, how we can get the patient in, how we can facilitate that process. Right now, physician reach out sometimes personally to physician to get their patient referred or they go through the call center at our institution. Um, I don't know, Dr. Pagani, do you have any other? Right, I think uh, it's, right. The one thing I would like to you know, emphasize I think is really critical is if, if, if you, you should really, if you have to err either way, too early or too late, really too early. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, there, we, there's no problem in, in saying, sending a patient and then we say, well, you're not well, you know, you're not sick enough at this point for advanced therapies. We, we were delighted to say that, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, as opposed to someone coming who's so sick that we have to put on ECMO or uh, some other temporary forms of device to stabilize them that limits their options and subjects them to such, um, you know, higher risk in terms of stroke and other things. And, really limits a, a lot of options. And so, you know, we would always, always happy to say, you're, you know, you're too well for, for advanced therapies at this time, follow up with us in six months time or, or a year or something to that effect. Um, and then just, and just continue to communicate with us. But I think that scenario is, is so much better than, than, than coming too late. Yep, I agree with that. So speaking of um, communication, it, one of the questions we have is what's the best form of communication to use to stay in the loop uh, when you are caring for a patient that someone refers to you? Okay, so um, my, my personal practice and I think my colleagues practice is to each time we see someone refer to us for advanced therapy eval or for a second opinion, usually you communicate with the referring physician by sending a letter. Um, some providers prefers to um, have uh, like to have a conversation over the phone and then we do our best to accommodate that. But for the most part, we do send a letter for referring provider each time we see patient in our clinic, just to keep everyone on the same page. And I also like to emphasize that we're all available through yep. Through, through through paging system yeah. through um, so in the event that something urgent is needed um, that we can all be reached and, mm -hmm. and I'm sure Eric will be happy to provide the contact information um, to everyone to just to, to facilitate that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. When we send our email out tomorrow morning, just thanking everyone for attending this evening, we will be sure to include the M line number. That's a number that you can uh, use when you want to set up an appointment or to uh, speak to Dr. Pagani or Dr. Pachar. So um, I don't have any more questions for you, but uh, I want to thank you very much for presenting this evening. And I want to thank everyone that attended. I do believe we have one more slide. We just want to kind of show you again. So thank you for attending. And if you are interested in claiming your CME credit, please go ahead and scan the uh, QR code on the left-hand side. We'll go ahead and let this sit for a little bit. And then just a reminder, we'll send that information to you again uh, in the email tomorrow morning. Again, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.